May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Welcome back to the Dominion Podcast. Season 2, episode 19. I, I know which episode it is. Although we're in a whole different series now. We're in the middle of this Christ and the Nation series. This will be the fourth installment in that. Um, we just had a great interview with Pastor Doug Wilson. We're very excited to share that with you. But before we do, we want to, uh, I guess, do some shout outs. Yeah. Yeah. What's, shout, out, uh, shout out to the Upper 40 Studios. That's right. Official sponsor. Yeah. He's, he's the reason for this you know, cabin background here, our red ensign, our muskets. Yeah. I believe Joe Boot said it was his favorite podcast background ever. Yeah, which, I mean, I mean either way, we're going to include that on a quote. I might be exaggerating that a bit, yeah. but... No, that's... You can embellish a little. <laughs> Hyperbole. <laughs> Hyperbole. It's a rhetorical technique. That's right. Anyway, but thanks to Tristan for always opening up their space to us here. And, and uh, of course, Kawartha Classical Christian School unofficial sponsored closed for the summer giving the staff a much needed break time with their uh, families and vacations and fun in the sun and all that sort of thing but apparently the kids are already missing it they miss it the first week <laughs> isn't that wild i, I never missed school no in the summer ever no and i think one of our that's one of the testimonies we can give just practically it's like come to a school where your kids are sad to leave yeah and that's all we need to tell you. And to be honest, I was talking with a brother in the Lord this week and um, just, you know, encouraging us to let people know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And people move. This is the kind of community, the kind of school uh, that you uproot your family and you move to be a part of. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are sitting on the fence and we haven't, education is not something we've had to prioritize because it's just been there. Yep. So we think in terms of our careers or in terms of accumulating other things, our time and energy and focus is given elsewhere, but you can't rely on the state to educate your kids and you shouldn't anyways. But if, if the education of our children is really the most important thing we give ourselves to as parents, we need to make sure we're connected to a solid local church and to a solid community of people, whether that be homeschooling people or whether that be a Christian school that started. Um, these are the most important things you can invest in. Yeah. Not hockey, not hobbies, not vacations. Not boats. Not boats. You know, it's the it's the raising your children, tuning their hearts to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what's going to matter. And so we just want to encourage people not only to support us financially and to pray for us, but if your family is listening to this and you're wondering what to do and it seems extreme to move, there's nothing extreme about that. No. Um, moving is as easy as it has ever been in history. Uh, come to Peterborough, come to Westmount, come to Hill City, put your kids, classical Christian education, I mean, you won't regret it. I mean, we're talking about your life. You're, you're talking about being around other believers who yes. actually want to follow Jesus and, mm -hmm. and submit themselves to his lordship in every aspect of their lives. Like, are you willing to just waste away somewhere where you don't have that fellowship mm -hmm. week in and week out mm -hmm. uh, because that's where you grew up or yeah. that's where your stuff is? I mean, and we're in a, yeah. people need to realize we're in a pioneering season. Yeah. You know, this is not the time to bemoan the fact that there's not one in your city or there's not a solid church. It's like, this is the time to move. We're the, yeah. we're hoping that be, be by our children and our grandchildren, that there are more churches, that there are more schools, that there are more um, Christian communities to be a part of. But right now, yeah, there's not a lot. And there's a, I mean, we all know this in the little things, but there is a cost uh, of discipleship. Yeah. Right. And, um, we also, think that it should come easy. We do. And, and, uh, you know, we talk about dominion and, and building something for the next generation and we think well, that's just going to happen, but it doesn't, it, no. it's actually going to cost us yes. a lot and we have to be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't do a lot of, uh, you know, pleas for, for support and that sort of thing on the, on the podcast here, but like n nobody involved here is, is, you know, making a cent off this, this isn't mm -hmm. for our monetary benefit, but you know, we've steadily seen the influence of the podcast grow and expand yeah. now with, with Ben and with Jacob who are doing regular mm -hmm. uh, articles uh, that's expanded our reach even more. But um, 
you know, if you want to see that reach expand and, mm-hmm. and have other people blessed the same way you are, we would highly encourage you to go to the Substack, go to dominionpress.ca and uh, subscribe, whatever, it's a dollar a month, five dollars a month, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it would help grow the reach of the, of the podcast and the influence. And again, you know, I, I got a job. I don't need, I don't need money. Mm-hmm. I mean... You could probably use some money. I'm just kidding. You give me money. <laughs> I'd be happy to give you money. If you want to do some work for me. We're going to lunch after this. <laughs> yes, we are. All right. Looking forward to that. But uh, anyway, that's that's my humble plea. Um, we ought to be prepared to, to pay for things that are worth paying for. Mm-hmm. And I think we've been providing some, some pretty stellar content here. And it's only getting better now that we've had some professional writers jump on board. You know? And, and <laughs> you know, your shirt game has just been on point. Yeah. You shaved? I, sh- I even shaved and cut my, cut all my hairs. Cut all you, your hair. Dude, you should have seen the bathroom. It looked like a cat exploded. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a disaster zone, man. <laughs> it's a massacre in there. <laughs> oh man. But uh, Hey, we just had a great interview with Joe boot. Can't wait to, sh- not Joe boot. Uh, that was last week. Uh, with pastor Doug Wilson. Yep. And we can't wait to share it with you. But uh, before we do that, just some quick thoughts. I mean, for me, I, f- I was so encouraged by uh, pastor Doug because he's one of those guys who has this persona that precedes him mm-hmm. rightly or wrongly and a lot of that is dictated by his detractors they have this they have this caricature of him that they put out there to you know in a sense scare people away from him mm-hmm. but when you actually talk to him basically his his worldview boils down to and he, and he says this at the end is is go to church worship god sing the psalms and pray you know i mean mm-hmm. if if you want if if you want to, to please God and you want to accomplish the things we want to accomplish, that's it. I mean, do do those things and everything else will follow. And that was very encouraging. Yeah, it was it was awesome to meet with him. And the, one of the strengths of Doug's ministry is that it's um, he lives what he preaches. Yeah, and so he's been living these things that he believes God commands in his word for decades. Mm-hmm. And you could see the fruit in his children's life and his marriage and his grandchildren in the church that he's a part of in the schools and institutions that have been, that have borne up under him and the men that have been equipped alongside of him. Uh, so as he likes to say, your theology has to come at your fingertips and we've seen that. So we, we like to talk to guys who are walking the walk, not mm-hmm. just talking the talk and, we hope that our viewers will be encouraged to um, to make Christ not only the center of their life, but to strive and pray uh, and preach that Christ would be exalted in our nation and in all the nations. Awesome. Well, can't wait for you guys to be edified. Let's uh, switch over there. We want to welcome today Pastor Douglas Wilson to the podcast. Uh, we're very glad to have Hi. you here. Great to see you. And I, I just good have to, good to be with you. <laughs> before we start, I just have to chide my fellow <laughs> host here. I thought you were going to wear a, a colorful shirt and we were going to call this the Tommy Bahama Dialogues. <laughs> oh, well. I didn't think Pastor Doug would go for that. <laughs> Doesn't roll off the tongue as well as the sweater vest dialogues, that's for sure. <laughs> anyway, we're happy to have you here. I'm going to let Alex... Good to be with you. Uh, as if you need an intro, but we'll get Alex to let the people know who you are. Yeah, Doug, Doug Wilson is a pastor in Moscow, Idaho. And he is married to Nancy, and Nancy herself has been a source of a lot of encouragement and help to the women in our church through her writing and her teaching, her podcast. Uh, Doug is the proprietor of the infamous blog and May blog, and uh, he haunts people's dreams through that thing. So, <laughs> especially the CBC. Yeah, he's 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 not charismatic, but he does haunt people's dreams. <laughs> Um, he is the author of many books, especially on practical Christianity. He is one of the pioneers in the resurgence of the classical Christian education movement. He was, you know, an inspiration and point of instruction for us as we were thinking through starting a school, reading his books, and listening to him speaking on these things. And uh, many of us in Canada have appreciated his writing for years, particularly on the family and culture. So thanks again for joining us, Pastor Doug, and and uh, for all that you're doing. We really appreciate it. 
Well, thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to start going back a little bit and think and think through how we got here, or more specifically, how you got here. So the tagline of your ministry is all of Christ for all of life for all the world, and um, I think a lot of people have. Have, who listen to you and who read your books have probably thought, how could we have a tagline that we can't use his, but that's really, <laughs> that, that, that is really the, the best tagline. And, and what I want to ask is when did you develop this point of emphasis in your life as a Christian and for your ministry? Because um, obviously it set the trajectory to where you are now. Uh, yeah, there were a number of factors. One is m- my father, who is a gifted evangelist and Bible teacher, but not Reformed and not uh, uh, not Peter Baptist, mm-hmm. not Calvinistic mm-hmm. like I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was nonetheless the kind of uh, Christian who just believed whatever verse was in front of him, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Whether whether or not it fit with the larger system, mm-hmm. he had a sort of a phobia against systematic theology, mm-hmm. but he was also honest with. Uh, uh, many texts that were right in front of him, like the Great Commission. Mm-hmm. So he he always thought in terms of, well, we were told to disciple the nations. Here are the people. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. You know. So he he thought that if Jesus told us to take that hill, then we should be doing what we can to take that hill. Mm-hmm. So that that was what I grew up in. What whatever the text says, you should just go for it. Mm-hmm. Then in uh, in the mid '80s, uh, through a series of circumstances, I had abandoned my. I grew up in evangelical circles, so I was generically pre-mill because everybody is, mm-hmm. and I abandoned that. And probably for two or three years, I didn't know what I was. And uh, as a result of the reading and study I was doing, I came to a post-millennial conclusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it happened while I was reading a book that I that wasn't all that can, uh, I didn't like all that much because the uh, <laughs> the book the the hermeneutic employed was a little bit too gaudy. Mm. Um, so I was there. I don't know. But when I was reading the book, uh, the author uh, David Chilton quoted a verse from First Corinthians fifteen. Uh, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Mm-hmm. And when I read that something snapped in my head Mm -hmm. it was like uh, okay and all these verses and all these things i'd been reading sort of assembled Mm -hmm. rapidly in my head like one of those transformer thingies i just uh, and it was a lot of fun to be frank uh it was it was um so i became post-millennial in the mid 80s and it transformed it just uh, it gave um, a foundation to the labors that we were already engaged in we, you know, we were already trying to influence culture and think in terms of uh, uh, all things with the scriptures at the center. But uh, post-millennialism sort of g- gave the footings and the foundation under, underneath that in the mid-80s. And as things developed, I preached and taught on this, that this optimistic view began to take root in our community. And I remember I was being interviewed for some video clip uh, on some topic or other. And uh, the whatever the question was, the phrase, all of Christ for all of life, came to mind mm-hmm. in just in my answer. I just said that in my answer. And then, the, oh, that's sticky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's it wasn't anything new. But it sort of encapsulated everything that we were uh, trying to do mm-hmm. in a in a sticky way, mm-hmm. and anybody in the whole world is free to adopt it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's it, basically it's not all of Christ for all of life for all the world. Uh, copyright Doug Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Trademark <laughs> Doug Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Well, that might be our new uh, our slogan then for the Dominion yeah. podcast. Do you mind if I ask a question about eschatology? Not at before all. We, I know this is sort of getting to where we want to go to, but uh, what would you say to uh, premillennialists who sort of have a similar vision to yours? Um, yeah. Are, are they being inconsistent or uh, or 
is there a way for for both of those views to kind of pursue these same ends? Uh, no, not at all. So, for example, Charles Spurgeon was a premillennialist, mm-hmm. and he shared the same kind of optimistic historical mm-hmm. vision that I have. Okay, so if you take the other two major positions, um, amillennialism and premillennialism, it's okay. Uh, well, let me back up. All Christians are optimistic if you're talking about the end of the world Mm -hmm. and the resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. So every Christian position that believes in the second coming and the general resurrection is optimistic that way. Mm -hmm. But post-millennialism is optimistic about the course of the gospel in human history Mm -hmm. prior to the second coming. Mm -hmm. So that's that's baked into the post-mill position. Mm -hmm. But that that kind of historical optimism is allowable in the pre-mill position and in the amill position. Yeah. So you will hear um, certain amillennialists say, well, I'm an optimistic amill. Mm-hmm. And I, I just shake hands with him as a brother and say, great, yeah. uh, that, that's good enough for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are not that many optimistic pre-mills, but Spurgeon was one of them. Mm-hmm. And I'd be happy to shake hands with him and say, great, I'm not... I'm not interested in getting into big arguments about the train schedules mm-hmm, and yes. all the. <laughs> uh, um, but basically, it, do you believe that we can make a difference in this world, uh, preaching the gospel to the nations and bringing the nations to Christ? Mm-hmm. Do you think it's fair to say um, that one of the the reason for the distinctions in eschatology? I mean, we define them in relation to the millennium. And in one sense, right. I understand that. But I mean, I'm reading through um, Gentry's book and, and I read through your book, Heaven Misplaced. And I, I essentially affirm almost everything. I'm reading this thinking, absolutely. And the thing that's least clear in my mind is the, ap- is the actual millennium. Yeah. But it's the, it's, the, it's the hermeneutical principles. And for me, it's, it is what was accomplished in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. It's not really yeah. about my view of how things shake out, although I know there's implications. But yeah. the, what would you say to that? That this is, the, your eschatology isn't beginning with the end. It's really beginning with, well, the beginning. You know, what it even... Well, yeah. I, absolutely. I think eschatology should begin with the love of God mm-hmm. and the proclamation of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. That's what you see in the Gospels, mm-hmm. and that's what you see in the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. They preach the resurrection, they preach the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Um, the millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things that we, one of the reasons we fight about it is that it's an obscure. Uh, verse and reference in an obscure chapter in the most obscure book of the Bible, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's the only place the millennium is mentioned Mm -hmm. is in chapter 20 of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And all three positions derive their name from that uh, that particular hinge. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be happy to um, Say God bless you to someone who said I'm a Revelation 20 agnostic. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the I don't know what the heck is going on there, mm-hmm. and still be able to say, but the kingdom of God is what we see in Genesis through mm-hmm. Revelation. Yes, yes. I, I I don't think we've got an upside down pyramid teetering on one verse. No, mm-hmm. that's not that's not what this is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. So, how would you? One of the things that's come out especially in Canada over the last three years. But I think you see this even in even reading through, um, you know, publications in America and probably the Western church is there's, there's, there's one of the most pervasive ideologies is what we call pietism. And you don't really notice it because without there being a crisis or a conflict or something pushing back, it sounds that a lot of the language is the same. You know, we talk about prayer and scripture and the Lordship of Christ and going to church and doing, there's a lot of Christian language, but then you realize that, you know, when you talk about eschatology or when you talk about culture issues, that there's really a different worldview beneath that view of Christianity. Um, How do you think, you have, you know, building on the all of Christ for all of life, for all of the world. Uh, how have you avoided that ditch, of a, a pietistic ditch in your life and ministry? 
Well, I uh, I was privileged. Well, I've got a good deal of experience with the Pietistic world. Yeah, having grown having grown up in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've I've grown up in the evangelical world. Mm -hmm. My parents, I would describe as Pietistic, but sort of an old school Pietism, mm -hmm. where they didn't just limit it to things like the thoughts you thought in your head. Yes, or the or the sensations you felt in your heart. They were immensely practical people, and thought that this needed to be publicly out, mm -hmm. you know, worked out in your life in the actual world. Yes, it had to change. It had to change the way you behaved. Um, now they didn't have the same vision that I do for the world out there across the street. You know, the the unbelieving world being brought to Christ. They had a vision for individuals being converted, but mm -hmm. not institutions and and cultures, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but they were they were insistent on application and everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what good is it unless you plug it in? Mm -hmm. What good is it unless you uh, go do something different? Mm -hmm. Do something different, not feel something different. Mm -hmm. So, Pietism uh, basically has I would say Pietism at large is is retreatism. Yes, where you you retreat into your closet. And it doesn't make a difference if it's a prayer closet. You've retreated into your closet. Mm -hmm. Or in the corporate manifestation, you retreat behind the four walls of the church. Yeah, you get a wise. And as, as long as they don't bother us here, then we're good. Mm -hmm. it's, okay. It turns out they do want to bother us there, too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, yeah, it seems like there's kind of a dualism beneath all of this. And you see this come out, in, I think, within reform circles, you see... Um, a living faith replaced with an intellectual ism, right? I am what what do you believe? Well, I believe what I think is what I believe, right? Whereas, whereas right. James would say, well, what you do is what you believe, yeah. not what you think you think right. about what you believe. Um, yeah. and there's a there's also a push against moralism, right? And so, but that with that push against moralism, there can be a hesitancy, and this has happened throughout history in the reform world against actions there's there's a there's an yeah. avoidance or a trepidation about obedience that if you talk about yeah. obedience and if you talked about acting and works you're drifting away from justification by faith mm -hmm. and so yeah. i mean a lot of us got caught up in this 15 years ago this was really big and the young let restless reformed right um there's right. a huge like it's all about grace and grace is the an antithesis to all obedience and it was really harmful so I, I see yeah. a lot of people now, there's a, this dualism is present where people don't have a category for Christian action and yeah. obedience. Right. There's a difference between pietism and piety. Yeah. Pietism yeah. is retreatism. Piety is good and godly. Yeah. There's a difference between moralism and morality. Yeah. Um, I'm fond of saying that theology comes out your fingertips mm -hmm. and Whatever it is that's coming out of your fingertips is your theology. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. You you exhibit what you believe by what you do. Yes, right. Jesus and said, of course, yeah. if, if if someone says, um, "Oh, you're drifting into works righteousness," no, sola fide, justification by faith alone. It's punctiliar. It's mm -hmm. but the faith that justifies you doesn't go away. Having, having justified you, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. We're to mm -hmm. walk by faith. We're to, uh, the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. That means we begin by faith, continue by faith, and finish by faith. Mm -hmm. And all of that has to do with sanctification. Mm -hmm. So we're not only justified by faith in a high Westminsterian sense. We're justi justified by faith alone. But we're also sanctified by faith. Mm -hmm. That same mm -hmm. faith, the living yeah. faith. Yeah, the obedience uh, of faith, as Paul said. It strikes me that there's a correlation between this misunderstanding of our works and the effects of our salvation and uh, what, something you said rec uh, in one of your recent comments here about um, bear, you know, bringing the gospel to bear on institutions. People hear that mm -hmm. and they're thinking, oh, he wants to just you know Christianize the school board. Uh, but you're thinking, I want to Christianize the people on the school board so that the school board will then have those influences, yeah. right? And Correct. so uh, we're just talking about the effects of the gospel, mm -hmm. right? So um, exactly. one question I have for you is, 
one of the unique features of your ministry, as far as I can tell, is your immersion in literature. Hmm. So this is not something I grew. I didn't grow up thinking of pastors as men who are well read, even in theology, to be honest, but especially not outside of the theological realm. Um, but you obviously care about education. You want you know your students to read the great books, and you want to expose them to good literature. How how much do you think literature and your immersion in it has played into your capacity to create categories? Because it feels like even with the Christian nationalism debate, I think Twitter and social media exacerbate this. People become parrots. They they function in a single paradigm. They see everything through it, and they don't have the capacity to develop categories. And I remember in a video like 10 years ago, Piper saying, you know, reading the Bible requires the capacity for category creation. And that stuck with me. Mm-hmm. And and it seems to me you have a unique ability to form categories mm-hmm. based on scripture. Uh, you're often refuting people who just aren't hearing what you're saying. Like it's not like right. they actually <laughs> disagree. They're just attacking something that's not real. Mm-hmm. So right. like, maybe comment on that and the role of literature in, in the life of the mind for you. One of the things that literature does is that it, it, it enables you to participate in way more conversations mm-hmm. than you otherwise would be able to participate in. Mm-hmm. It also, if you're reading a good writer, it enables you to function inside people's heads. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So... I've been in a lot of conversations with people, and that requires you to hone your theology and your responses. Yes. It, it, it insists that someone's going to come back at you and say, you're saying, no, I've got to make this distinction, and so forth. Um, reading good literature is going to help you understand what makes people tick. Mm-hmm. What? what's actually going on? What are they saying? What are they doing? And what are they feeling underneath that? Mm -hmm. So basically, um, John Stott, in his book on preaching, uh, which is called Between Two Worlds, Mm -hmm. um, he says, on the one hand, the preacher needs to be an exegete. He needs to understand what the message of the scripture, the message of the passage is. What is the Bible saying here? But then on the other hand are the people that he's preaching to, mm-hmm. and they inhabit a particular culture, and they think in particular ways. They they hear things in particular ways. And the preacher's job is to be a bridge between those two worlds. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Well, if I just go to seminary and study the Bible, 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 and I don't have any idea about what's going on in the world outside, I might as well go preach to them in Sanskrit. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to be able to communicate with them. So I have to bring two wires together. Mm-hmm. What, uh, what's going on in the world and what's going on in the text. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, as a herald, you tell the people that if there's a discrepancy, then you're the ones that must change because the Bible's not going to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. Um, maybe switching gears now to the topic of Christian nationalism one of the phrases that you use and have for for as I mean I've read this for quite a while now is the term mere Christendom, and you have a book yes. come that has come out mere Christendom. We actually in Peterborough, our church bought enough copies, so Canon's going to put up a sign, and uh, <laughs> we're going to get a picture the first day because it's definitely getting trashed for yeah. sure. But, <laughs> but we'll get a picture and we'll tag you in it online. But um, uh, okay, so so. You have been talking about mere Christendom. Now, in Canada especially, there is a huge aversion to the idea of being a Christian nation for reasons that I don't need to go into. But maybe you could explain what you mean by mere Christendom and how has this been fleshed out over the course of several decades in Moscow, Idaho? Okay, so just before... Before bringing in the Christian part, yes, just just speaking sociologically, there are three rough groupings that people can organize themselves mm-hmm. in. Okay, you've got three basic options: you could be a tribalist, you could be a nationalist, or you could be a globalist. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's either 
global government, national governments, mm -hmm. or tribal mm -hmm. governments. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are your. That's what's on the menu. Okay, now, <clears throat> as a Christian, when I look at these things, when I look at globalism, let's say someone says, "Hey, let's do globalism." I'd say, well, are we going to do it in a way that God likes or in a way that God doesn't like? Mm -hmm. And how do we know? Well, he wrote a book. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, Good okay. news. <laughs> uh, if someone says, I, I want to be a tribalist, I say, okay, are we, are we talking about uh, Thunderdome uh, warlords? <laughs> uh, we, are we talking about tribes each inhabiting their own valley and peacefully trading with each other what are we pleasing god in our tribes mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. okay and then nations the same thing so as it happens we are currently organized in nations mm -hmm. Where, uh, there's germany and there's england and there's france and there's the united states and mexico we were that's the na nations part is there mm -hmm. that's what we're that's what we're uh, currently dealing with i don't want to go to tribalism because i don't trust us to not break up into warring factions mm -hmm. i don't want to go go to globalism because i don't want to eat bugs and i don't want to you know <laughs> <laughs> eat crickets <laughs> eat crickets i don't want to do what the current ruling elites at the global level want us to do i don't trust those guys mm -hmm. and i don't trust the local warlords mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. i don't want to go either way mm -hmm. now i don't trust our national leaders either but it's where we this is where we are okay we're currently grouped in nations now it sounds like you have trust that, issues <laughs> <laughs> i do i do <laughs> your fears are well founded don't worry. now given the fact given this collection of nations a Christian, if, if a Christian is asked a very simple question, do you think these nations ought to behave in the way that Jesus wants or in the way that Jesus doesn't want? Yeah. Or, or does Jesus not care? Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if Jesus doesn't care, then congratulations, you're a deist. You mm -hmm. know, he, he, he made the world and then he wandered off mm -hmm. and he doesn't care what we do. So if he doesn't care what we do, well, then why should I care what we do? Mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. that's one thing mm -hmm. if and then you're down to the binary choice of is our behavior pleasing to god or not mm -hmm. well if someone says let's kill all the jews i would say that is displeasing to god mm -hmm. and i want to refuse to do it because it's displeasing to god mm -hmm. god god will judge it it's a sin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but as soon as i say well let's corporately turn and do something to please God because it pleases God, the accusation I will field immediately is you're a Christian nationalist. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm, a, I'm a, Now, the thing that people are afraid of, or at least they claim that they're afraid of, is they don't want jingoism or like xenophobia. Mm -hmm. um, um, but th that kind of person wants to outlaw Mother's Day <laughs> because only one, because only one person can have the best mother in the world. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, so I understand. For, for example, if I honor if I honor my mother as Scripture requires me to do, then I understand fully and completely why another man would honor his mother, mm -hmm. even though she's a completely different woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand a South Korean mm -hmm. who has affection for his people and language and customs. I understand that because I have affection for mine. Mm -hmm. And so, so basically, I think this is the basis for a magnanimous approach, mm -hmm. not a uh, my country right or wrong, and I'm going to go to war with anybody who, who dares to like their country. Mm -hmm. um, so nationalism is not the same thing as patriotism. Okay, mm -hmm. um, we've got the Fourth of July coming up. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna eat my hot dog with everybody and watch some fireworks and have a good time. And I, I love, I love my people, love my country, love the customs, but 
I have no expectation that a South Korean should feel the same way. Mm-hmm. You know, why should he? he he's got other customs that I, uh, I have great respect for and like it that he uh, has a different set of affections. So nationalism is the idea is not the idea that we're number one, mm-hmm. right? It's it has it doesn't have to anything to do with pride of place. Mm-hmm. It simply has to do with I'm I'm a member of a nation. I'm a citizen of a nation, and I should want that nation to be under the blessing of God. Mm-hmm. And being under the blessing of God means doing it God's way. Mm-hmm. And I think Christians in other nations should feel exactly the same way about their nation. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, it's and it's interesting because there's a certain hypocrisy in in our country. For example, our prime minister says that we are a post national state, <laughs> whatever that means, whatever that means. <laughs> but but no one has inflicted more um, pain and misery by threat of law against the citizens than our f- current federal government. It's like, which one is it? Are we, are we, do I have an obligation to obey you or do I not? Do I have an obligation to give you money or do I not? Mm -hmm. Well, if I do, then we are a nation. Like you can't, you can't play it both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He he calls him, he calls the country a post national thing, but notice he didn't call himself a post prime minister. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's like, Oh, I guess we're not listening to that guy anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for letting us off the hook. (laughs) Well, it's also interesting too, how this uh, ideology of globalism, which was, is supposed to create uh, unity has actually fractured Canada more than ever. Yeah. It seems like that's been the case in your country as well through the Obama. Yeah. So, yeah, I, it's almost like it's inescapable that there's going to be some type of, um, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, a nation is not going to hate another nation, but you still have to sort of group together in a sense. Yeah, it, it, basically, it's a territory with shared language, customs, uh, and a principle of unity. Mm-hmm. And some of the, part of that unity is political, mm-hmm. part of it is cultural, mm-hmm. part of it is religious. You know, there's got mm-hmm. to be some... There has to be some sort of gluten Mm -hmm. to hold the loaf together. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what what we're seeing in the um, the radical disruptions that are fomenting the West is the there's been an all out centuries long attack on the principle of unity that used to be there, which was the which was the Christian faith. Yes, Mm -hmm. and we're now discovering that that uh, is sort of Chesterton's fence. Uh, Chesterton once said that if someone said he's going to remove this fence, Chesterton said, "Well, I don't, I don't think you should be allowed to remove the fence until you can tell me why they put it up mm-hmm. yeah. in the first mm-hmm. place." Mm-hmm. Right, right. What, what are, con- what are Christians contributing mm-hmm. to the cohesion that our civilization has enjoyed? Well, I would argue a great deal, mm-hmm. and we're discovering how much we contributed by what's happening when it's being taken away. Mm-hmm. Everything, everything's come. Everything's disintegrating in our hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pastor Jacob produced the documentary. You were in this as well, Antichrist and His Ruin, and he yeah. he kind of documents the historical fact of Christian culture in our nation. So one of the criticisms that people feign to care about is um, if you become a Christian nation, you will become intolerant. I mean, this is this is rich at this point because we live at a time of um, intolerance that has scarcely, well, has never been experienced in the West. Like literally in the history of the West, it hasn't been experienced. We're we're not actually progressing towards some utopian dream. It's becoming a, a hellscape and a pagan nightmare. And yeah. we, I, I call it the regime of total tolerance. Yeah, yeah total tolerance. <laughs> and, and, so, and, uh, setting aside the fact that the people who scream the loudest about tolerance are the least tolerant people, um, right. Christianity does actually provide the tools for tolerance and the principles for tolerance. And that has actually been the case, as imperfect as we've experienced it. Um, maybe you could comment on that. You know, what, what would a Christian nation look like as far as tolerance? 
Okay, I'm afraid you put the nickel in here. So <laughs> this is why I'm going to start waving my arms. <laughs> um, <laughs> good. <laughs> so good. So uh, when, when Christians are accused of, well, if you have a Christian nation or whatever, then we're going to have religious persecutions and the Spanish Inquisition is going to break out again. And, you know, all of that's those are the fears. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the things that people involved in this discussion need to do is read a book. Um, <laughs> you, you have to understand that liberty of conscience and religious toleration was a concept invented by, pioneered by Christians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's our baby. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who came. We're the ones who came up with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, rel religious liberty, religious toleration, liberty of conscience is something that grew out of the Reformation, not without some commotion. Right. right. Um, it was it wasn't an easy battle yeah. it wasn't an easy childbirth for the christian for for the christian uh culture to produce this mm -hmm. it was not easy mm -hmm. but we're the only ones who did it mm -hmm. okay and so what's happening is we developed the freest and most tolerant society in the history of the world mm -hmm. in the history of the whole world and it lasted for centuries mm -hmm. and the thing that made it work is now being jettisoned by the, our secular elites. Mm -hmm. And because it's being jettisoned, we are descending into this um, hellscape that you mentioned mm -hmm. of um, radical intolerance. Mm -hmm. So the, um, whether it's a hard totalitarian society or a soft totalitarian society, mm -hmm. whether it's Brave New World of Huxley or 1984 of or well, mm -hmm. or what I think we have developing is a mashup of those two things, yeah. you know, um, uh, uh, porn soma mm -hmm. being yeah. fed to masses mm -hmm. and, uh, and pot don't, mm -hmm. don't, you know, marijuana, porn, all of that for, so those people can be the lotus eaters. Mm -hmm. And then the Orwellian crackdown on anybody who makes any kind of uh, trouble at all. Mm -hmm. uh, this, these totalitarian aspects uh, exhibit the one essential feature of totalitarianism which is no questions mm -hmm. there there must be no questions you may not question authority you may not talk back you may not think your own thoughts you there's no follow-up q a mm -hmm. and uh, you can you can say the most ridiculous things and do the most ridiculous things and that's a standard procedure in uh quieting a population mm -hmm. Uh, so what happens uh, it, when our uh, armed forces, uh, and let's say special forces, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. whether it's a CIA thing or uh, when they go into a, an area that they want to quiet down, they, is, they issue um, decrees or rules, and the rules must be stupid. Mm-hmm. Wear a mask because yeah, <laughs> yeah the, because if you if you issued re really reasonable common sense rules, most common sense people are going to follow them. Yeah, right. But if you issue stupid decrees, stupid rules, there'll be a big block of people who comply, and then you've identified all the troublemakers. Yeah, right. It's basically it's a beta test mm -hmm. for who's going to be who's going to be the difficult ones mm -hmm. when we uh, issue our climate change church closure. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, church closures um, decree. Yes, all right. So all the all the people who didn't quit meeting the anti-vaccine, anti-mask, anti-lockdown churches mm -hmm. are are now known to the people generally, mm -hmm. which is why those churches are growing. Mm -hmm. People are fleeing to them. Mm -hmm. And they're also known to the government. The, the, they, they know who's going to be trouble in round two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So uh, ba basically, oh, I, one other thing I wanted to say. In 1892, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision in the United States that declared that the United States was a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and it was a, an exquisitely named Supreme Court case. It was the United States versus Holy, Holy Trinity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How presumptuous. <laughs> yeah, hey. Guess who wins that battle? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it was glorious. I, and I've read through the decision, and basically the short form is there was a law that prohibited the importation of cheap labor mm -hmm. uh, where, where the big uh, – uh, big companies would pay someone's passage over the United States, get them to work on their project, and then release them into the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a law against that. Mm -hmm. There was a church named Holy Trinity that called a British minister to be their pastor, mm -hmm. and they paid for his passage. Mm -hmm. So naturally, it wound up in court, mm -hmm. and the, that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided the case on the merits quite sensibly, and it was... Uh, this law wasn't talking about that. Don't be dumb. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, the, then the Supreme Court, the justice who wrote the majority opinion, said, um, "While we're here, let let's review America's Christian history, mm -hmm. and we're and let's talk about how the United States is undis indisputably a Christian nation." Okay, that was 1892. Now, the point that I want to make here is that in 1894, two years after that decision. It was not the Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, yeah. All right. It was a it was a free and prosperous country mm -hmm. where you were not hammered for thinking what you thought. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was not that sort of thing. Yeah. So there there are blemishes and warts in every human society, and the Christian West has not done it perfectly. But I will say we did it way better than anybody else did. Mm -hmm. So. Religious toleration, religious liberty, freedom of conscience is our child. Yes. We, yeah. we, this is not something – you don't need to be afraid of us taking it away. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who brought it, brought it about in the first place. And Christianity provides the tools for actually changing. Mm -hmm. So we're, once you abandon the standard of God's word, you don't have the forgiveness offered in the gospel. You don't have an right. objective standard for ethics to even judge by your failures by. So it's yeah. only Christians that think that there's a standard of governance, there's a standard of right and wrong. There's you know something we ought to be striving towards that we can identify in ourselves where we fall short that we can, by God's grace, repent of our sins and receive his forgiveness and, and move in that direction. And part exactly. of the problem is in our secular progressive culture, it's not only the hellscape we find ourselves in, mm -hmm. it's that there's no possibility of change. Mm -hmm. There's there's actually yeah. no possibility for transformation. Um, one of the things we were just discussing before you came on is we're gonna. I'm planning on running a beta test where I burn a certain flag that's been flying around lately, and we're gonna <laughs> see. We're gonna test the tolerance of the present regime and and basically expose. I mean, the good thing that we find ourselves in in this clown parade is that we can point and say, "Well, look at this." Right? It's like just last week in Toronto. You know, there's tons of fully naked men walking down the street in front of children. And there's a video going around of a guy calling a police officer in Toronto and saying, just to get the record straight, is it not a criminal offense to expose yourself publicly and especially to children? Not if you're wearing sparkles. And he said, oh, are you referring to the Pride Parade? And he said, well, that's where I saw it. And he's like, yeah, I mean, there's, it, it, technically there's, you know, they, they do that a lot. <laughs> he wouldn't answer the question. <laughs> he basically came out and said, you know, we don't prosecute that. But, but, you know, the mutilation of children and the utter, like, forced vaccinations on people, all of these things, we can actually point to and say, this is where your world goes, right? This is, this is not the shining light of tolerance and diversity and equality. Right. This is, it's the French Revolution. It's an utter lie. And, yeah. and that's kind of what I wanted to maybe ask you about. You've talked about this, the difference between the American and the French Revolution and the, yes. and the outcomes. Could you maybe just touch on that briefly? Because that's helpful. Uh, yes. Um, the 19th century, many people look back on it and think that was the, that was the heyday of traditional values. Mm -hmm. uh, the 19th century was actually a monkey house of radicalism. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was and it was bookended by the French Revolution, 
just prior to the 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, at the latter end of the 1700s, mm -hmm. and the Russian Revolution just into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And it was a century of revolution and foment and chaos and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Many people believe that the prototype for the French Revolution was the American Revolution, mm -hmm. but it was utterly different. Mm -hmm. So Edmund, Edmund Burke, the father of modern conservatism, was a member of parliament. He was opposed to the French Revolution from the starting pistol, mm -hmm. from the, from the get-go. He, he saw where it was going and opposed it because he saw the radicalism inherent in it. Mm -hmm. So he opposed, he opposed the French Revolution before the terror, mm -hmm. basically, knowing that the guillotine terror or something like it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's, that same Edmund Burke, with the same um, insight, supported the American colonists in their war for independence, mm -hmm. which is what it was more strictly, more accurately, it was a war for independence, not a revolution. Mm -hmm. because uh, the Americans were fighting for their ancient constitutional rights as Englishmen. Yeah. In other words, if you grew up in Maryland or in Virginia or in Connecticut, you grew up in that under a certain government and you died and your grandchildren died under that same government. It was not a leveling uh, uh, thing the way the French Revolution was, where they guillotined the king and you know uh, and conducted the terror against the ruling class and stuff um it was a war for independence and the, and it was justified on the basis of constitutional argumentation right. which burke knew, burke burke knew and he knew that the americans were fighting for the english constitution and parliament in england was subverting the english constitution yeah and it is so it was a very it was a different world entirely different world mm -hmm. um the the american war for independence was conservative mm -hmm. and founded a conservative nation mm -hmm. a conservative and christian nation and the french revolution was radical and leftist and founded nothing of the kind and secular mm -hmm. yeah one of the one of the books that I found helpful on this is called Unbelief and Revolution. It's by a Dutch guy, Von Prinscher, and yeah. he's a contemporary. And he's he's basically drawing the parallel between unbelief and its nature mm. um, manifested in the French Revolution. That he's right. even at the time saying, "Look, no, no, no. The, the the underpinnings of this whole thing are fundamentally different." And what would you know? The the American Revolution was to put it simply, an appeal to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. It was an appeal yeah. to standards, whereas the French Revolution was a rejection of them, right? Right. And that's an, yeah. which is why, which is why they end up killing all the people who are the first round, right? Like, let's get all these guys it, out it here. Specifically, a rejection of the Christian standards, even yes. trying to go to a ten day work week or whatever. Also, you know, they're trying to yes. jettison that, right? Yeah. Right. In in the American War for Independence, I'll just mention this one thing because a lot of people uh, smudge this all up. When the when the colonies were sta established, they all had charters, mm -hmm. and in the charters, they were given the authority to have their own legislatures, mm -hmm. and the king the king was their executive, mm -hmm. and they had their own legislatures. Mm -hmm. So in Virginia, they had the House of Burgesses, and the king was their king, uh, and so on down the colonies. Uh, what happened was a power shift in England uh, because Parliament won a war against Charles I and wound up executing him for treason. Mm -hmm. And then after the the Restoration, where the monarchy came back, uh, Charles II and then James II, and James II was expelled, and the Glorious Revolution of 1688 happened, yeah. where all of a sudden Parliament, having executed one king and banished another, Parliament found itself in the power position in England, mm. right? And as a consequence, Parliament believed that they were in charge of the colonies, mm. but they they were not in charge of the colonies at all. The mm. colonies had their own charters, mm -hmm. their own constitutions, and basically the colonies in, were insisting on following the law, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And Parliament was trying to usurp the law, overthrow mm -hmm. the law, which is why the Declaration of Independence uh, register, registers all their complaints against the king. The king is the only one they had to do with. And and the king was one the one who was failing to protect them from this unconstitutional usur usurpation 
on the part of Parliament. Mm -hmm. So basically, the American Revolution was profoundly conservative, mm -hmm. and the French Revolution was profoundly progressive. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as this is sort of the difference between the statist impulse and the nationalist impulse, right? Statism tends, yes. it seems to be uh, wholly secular mm -hmm. uh, and anti-God. So I guess one question I'd ask is why are so many Christians uh, who oppose this idea of Christian nationalism, why do they tend to be statists, especially here in yeah. Canada? Like, I, oh, <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really remarkable because... If someone said, "So, are you a Christian nationalist? Are you? you know, how American are you?" I would say, "Well, I'm pretty American, right? <laughs> I'm. Um, my mom was Canadian, but uh, ba ba Lord basically, uh, yes, yeah, Lord bless her. All the good you see. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. That's um, the secret sauce, right that's there. Right. <laughs> that's, a, that's the secret sauce. So, um, the I'm, but if I look at all my Americanness." very, very little of it has to do with the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has to do with my, uh, the books I read, has to do with the family I grew up in, has to do with the geography around me, has to do with customs, has to do with the truck I drive. It, do it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't depend upon Congress, mm. right? Um, my, my national identity is not state dependent. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's the meaning behind the bumper sticker that you see on the right, which is, I love my country, I fear my government. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, for progressives, it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right? I, I love my government. Yeah. I fear my country. I fear my country. Yeah. Right. So, why don't, maybe this is a good place to end um, and let you get going here. This has been really helpful. I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe encourage Christians in Canada who find ourselves, in some ways, we're in the midst of a French revolution, mm -hmm. that we are in the midst of a secular, and it's, here it's very aggressive and overt. So the laws mm -hmm. that are being put in place, like we just had a law that the government now can compel social media to not run Canadian news. So people online will not see news stories that the state doesn't want them to see. That just passed. We have we have legislation presently in place that forbids anyone, including parents, from engaging in conversion therapy, which is to eat, counsel anyone in any way but sure do what you want to their children with right. regards to gender identity. So how would you encourage Christians who find themselves in the midst of a French Revolution? Um, you know, one of the one of the things I read is the reason that England didn't go this way was largely because of revival, because right. the, the revival broke out and there's a, a different religion, and therefore yeah. there wasn't a revolution. So, what would your encouragement be to Christians in Canada who are the minority, who are in ourselves powerless, who find ourselves in the midst of a cultural revolution? What should we be doing? So you're exactly right. The reason England did not go through its equivalent of the French Revolution was due to men like George Whitfield and the mm -hmm. Wesley brothers. Mm -hmm. the, the evangelical awakening in England, I'm convinced, is what um, made the conditions unconducive mm -hmm. to that kind of revolution. And so consequently, I believe that the, the center of resistance, um, and here... Some in some states it's better than you have in Canada. In some states it's just as bad. Yeah, like in California, yeah. Illinois. So the disease, the disease is everywhere. Mm -hmm. the The antidote, I believe, is uh, hot gospel mm -hmm. from Christian pulpits, mm -hmm. right? Where you where you are not afraid to preach and declare the crown rights of King Jesus mm -hmm. in an open worship service. Mm -hmm. So I believe that worship is warfare, and I believe that at, uh, all God has to all God has to do to deliver us is to nod His head. Mm -hmm. all, all, and so, what we want to do is show up at His house of worship on His appointed day mm -hmm. and appear before Him and, like uh, Hezekiah, lay out the uh, lay out the dangerous letter. Before the Lord, mm -hmm. say, um, 
Lord, what are, you, what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. Because all God has to do is nod his head and Sennacherib is yeah. gone. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So God loves cliffhangers. Mm-hmm. Um, he This is his MO. He does it over and over again. And if I could quote Chesterton uh, again, uh, he said, the one taste of paradise on earth is to fight in a losing cause and then not lose. Hmm. And I believe objectively on the ground, our our position is hopeless. Mm-hmm. Okay, if I'm, if I'm a general looking at the forces and looking at the resources and looking at who stayed firm over these last few years, mm-hmm. uh, we are outgunned, outmaneuvered, outspent, out everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one man and God outnumber everybody. That's right. And there's a there's a line in uh, J- John Knox writes somewhere uh, in the Reformation. He said it was as though men reigned from heaven, mm-hmm. and <laughs> and and it was not that was not called for. That was not expected. How many mm-hmm. times has it looked really grim for the people of God? Mm-hmm. Well, hundreds. Mm-hmm. hundreds of times mm-hmm. so i don't think we're unique in this and i believe that our summons is to trust god and worship him mm-hmm. and and say out loud what his word teaches us to say mm-hmm. so preach the gospel together with god's people and then uh, god will uh, god will open doors and avenues for people you know i didn't know that guy who just got converted was a member of parliament and mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, amen. That's super encouraging. Very encouraging. And we want to be respectful of your time, so we'll let you go. But uh, before you do, I'm just going to read this from Isaiah chapter 9 to close us off. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. We'll see you next time on the Dominion Podcast. Amen. Amen.